We have to get you to come visit Montreal in person. That you'll be. Closer. My my parents live in Lake Placid, New York, which is not far. So right there. Yeah. Yeah. We're we're live. We're live. Yeah. We're live. Okay. Okay, we're live. Perfect. <laughs> so welcome everybody to the chit chat session between myself and Alex Williams. <laughs> Alex <laughs> is uh, our next speaker. Uh, so let me introduce him a little bit here. Um, Alex Williams is currently uh, a postdoc in the statistics department and Woodside Neuroscience Institute at Stanford University, working with Scott Linderman's research group. Uh, but in January uh, 2022, he will begin a joint appointment as an assistant professor at the Center for Neural Science at NYU and an associate research scientist slash group reader at the uh, leader at the Center for Computational Neuroscience at the Flatiron Institute in New York City. So this is a, a good good catch for all the field that Alex is going to be operating his own group. Uh, Alex obtained his PhD from the neuroscience program at Stanford University under the supervision of Surya Ganguly, who uh, is giving the kilo, keynote this afternoon. So um, without further ado, Alex is going to talk to us about principled methods for comparing neural representations across biological and artificial networks. So the floor is yours. Thanks, Guillaume. Let me share my screen. All right. And can people, I mean, I, I'm going to assume people can see my cursor here, but yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, not we can see it. too much. Okay, great. Awesome. Um, all right. Well, well, thanks so much to the organizers for the invitation to speak. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, so th this talk is going to be about comparing representations, or if you like, hidden layer activation patterns across neural networks, either across uh, different biological networks or artificial networks. Um, so I think this is a topic that most people in the audience are probably already very familiar with. Um, and certainly a lot of speakers at this conference have already talked about this. And um, I think this is going to continue to come up. So the focus of this talk is going to be thinking about this problem mathematically from first principles. So at the end of the talk, I'm going to give you a very small taste of some um, applications of these methods to real data. But the primary goal of this talk is going to be um, building up a, a rigorous toolkit of statistical methods with the hope that you, the audience, are going to come up with uh, many more creative applications uh, of these ideas than I can fit into this one talk. Um, so before I begin, I want to thank my co-authors on this project. This is all joint work with Aaron Kuntz and uh, Scott Linderman at Stanford University and Simon Kornblith uh, at Google Brain in Toronto. And all the results that I talk about are going to be um, in this paper that we're presenting at NeurIPS next week. And you can find this paper online for more technical details. And uh, yeah, so please read that paper and reach out to us if you have more questions. Um, so the high-level goal of our work is to develop tools that help us understand neural networks. So in neuroscience, we want to understand how neural activity in different brain regions contributes to behavior and to psychiatric disease. And in deep learning um, and in machine learning, generally, there's many scenarios where we'd like to have a better understanding of how deep artificial networks function and not treat them as black boxes. So I imagine that I'm mostly preaching to the choir at a conference like this, so I'm not going to belabor this motivating slide any further. Um, but the problem that we run into is that reverse engineering the brain and artificial networks um, is very, very challenging, as I think everybody here knows. Um, but what I'd argue is that it's particularly challenging to reverse engineer these systems if you only study them one at a time, kind of in isolation, without studying the broader context. And I think there's a general principle here that's been objectively successful in many other areas of biology, that we should adopt um, kind of comparative perspectives and analysis uh, for our work. And in many ways, we're already doing this when it comes to neurobiology. So we know an immense amount about different neuroanatomical structures and how they're homologous across different animal species. And our understanding of the kind of shared evolutionary history is really important uh, when experimentalists are interpreting the findings that they um, collect. And if you dive down to uh, the level of molecular biology, there's also a large literature on studying genetic, genetic variation across individuals and across different animal species. And again, I think this has been a kind of objectively successful approach um, in developing practical tools for neuroscientists, but also in many other areas of medicine and biology. And if we zoom out to the level of behavior, again, I think comparative behavioral analysis has been a, a really instrumental, um, an instrumental part of neuroscience research by helping us 
um, understand what behaviors um, are interesting, uh, have interesting neural circuits underlying them and point us in the right direction to study. So for example, characterizing um, how social behaviors and vocalization patterns differ across um, evolutionary uh, related species. So I think anybody who has a background in biology has probably been taught the importance of these comparative perspectives and analysis at some point in your undergraduate research, for example. Uh, but it's a, a lesson that I think is easy for us to forget and important to keep in mind. Um, so the kind of pitch of this talk is that I, I think if we want to understand neural computations at a kind of algorithmic level, it might be um, fruitful for us to consider similar comparative approaches. And indeed, this is already an idea that has strong precedent in the field. So you heard earlier this morning from Jim DiCarlo, um, who's been a pioneer in this approach in computational neuroscience, showing uh, building a literature around comparing uh, hidden layer representations in deep networks and sensory representations in biological networks. Um, and in deep learning and machine learning itself, I think that the appetite for, uh, is growing to consider similar questions. So people are really interested in training neural networks that produce uh, multi-purpose representations that can be used for many different downstream tasks. And as, as part of this, um, researchers are becoming interested in understanding how changing the objective function, changing network architecture, or changing the training procedure impacts hidden layer representations and impacts their transferability and robustness on other tasks. So to me, this seems like a similar line of thinking that's emerging within the deep learning community. Uh, and within neuroscience itself, I think there's a lot of interest in comparing neural activation patterns between different biological systems. So both across individual animals of the same species or across different species. So here I'm just showing a famous result, which shows that visual responses in human and non-human primates uh, look very similar. Uh, so to me, this is one of the more exciting application areas because the experimental tools needed for this kind of analysis are really coming into focus uh, just now in the last few years. Okay, so let's formalize this question of what it means to quantify uh, similarity in neural representations. Um, so really when we're doing these kind of analysis, we're thinking of neural networks as being functions. They're mapping um, sets of inputs, U1 through UM, to outputs or what we'll call neural representations. So again, we can consider this mapping to be implemented by an artificial network um, or a biological network, in which case we'd be making experimental measurements. Um, but in both cases, we're going to record the outputs of these networks and collect them into matrices, which we're going to denote as X and Y. And the important thing is that we're going to feed in the same set of inputs or probe inputs to each network so that the rows of these matrices are matched to each other. So you can think of these, what I'm calling representation matrices, as being um, a discrete or finite approximation to the input-output mapping that the function is implementing. So as the number of probe inputs or the number of rows gets larger and larger, you get finer and finer scale resolution of this input-output mapping. Uh, so we boiled down the problem to computing um, the similarity between uh, different neural networks is really the same as computing the similarity between two matrices that look like this. Um, and the fundamental challenge here is that the neurons aren't matched across networks. So in fact, the number of neurons might be different in each network. But intuitively, there may be similar information about the inputs that's stored and represented in each system, but it's not immediately available to us. So we need to fit some sort of transformation or extract this shared structure. And it turns out that you, there's a lot of ways that you can go about doing this. So probably the simplest idea would be to fit a regression model to predict the activity in network Y from network X and use the R squared as a, as a measure of how similar the two networks are. Um, but there's also a variety of other methods that you can find by digging through the literature. So if you're in deep learning or machine learning, you're probably used to seeing people use centered kernel alignment or canonical correlations analysis. But if you're a cognitive neuroscientist, you're probably more familiar with uh, the literature on representational similarity analysis. So one of the main goals of our paper was to help people sort through this long list of possibilities and build up a general statistical theory. Um, so what I want to emphasize about this problem is that we really care about scaling these analyses up to large and complicated data sets. So all the methods that I showed you on the last slide work pretty well. Um, and especially, I think that they can work well if you're just looking to quantify some similarity between two networks at once. Um, but what I really care about 
doing in this talk is developing a more ambitious framework that can help us um, do more sophisticated analyses across many networks at once. So in reality, the data that we're interested in looks more like this. We're sampling the neural activations or hidden layer activations across K neural networks. And this could be recordings from 100 different mice or 100 uh, deep neural networks that we train up. And what we would like to do is kind of cohort level analysis on data sets like this. So for example, we might want to do dimensionality reduction, which is what I'm showing here on the right. Each point corresponds to a different neuropixels recording collected by Isabel Lowe and Lisa Giacomo's lab. And then once we've done this dimensionality reduction, we want to uh, do other sorts of um, unsupervised learning analyses like clustering, which is um, what's shown here in red and blue. And it turns out, I mean, the details of this don't matter, um, but uh, we were able to extract some simple clusters that corresponded to something that was experimentally interpretable in this case. So the point being that we would like to do these cohort level, um, more sophisticated analyses rather than just compare two networks at once. And so this is the kind of um, analysis I'll show you um, how to do by the end of the talk. And um, one of the reasons I'm really excited about this is I think the, the field of systems neuroscience is really going in this direction. So collaborations like the International Brain Lab are now collecting these standardized data sets from very large numbers of animals. And this is going to give us, I think, for the first time, the statistical power to say some really interesting things about animal to animal variability that before this, we simply haven't had the data for. So in, in this particular task, you're seeing behavioral learning curves from across about 100 mice. And you can see that there's a large amount of variability across animals. Some learn the task very fast, while, while others learn it very slow. So I, I, I think this is a really exciting direction that the field is headed. And I think the tools that I'm telling you about might help us compare neural representations in, for example, fast learning versus slow learning mice. OK, so at this point, I hope I've convinced you that the problem of comparing representations across networks is an important problem to study. And in the rest of the talk, I'm going to walk you through uh, a statistical framework. So the first part of the talk, I'm going to argue that what we'd really like to have are notions of distance that are proper metrics. And what this means is that we want distance functions that satisfy the triangle inequality across all sets of networks. So I'll, I'll unpack what that means. Um, but by establishing that, um, in the second part of the talk, I'll, I'll tell you our approach, which uses statistical shape analysis to achieve this. And then in the final part of the talk, I'll give you just a couple examples of how you might use these methods in practice. But the majority of the talk is going to be spent kind of laying the groundwork um, in these first two sections. OK. So let's back up and start from the beginning. We have measured hidden layer activations x and y, and we want to construct a distance function d. And what I'll claim is that we want this distance function to satisfy three properties. The, the first is that the distance between x and y is 0, um, if and only if x and y are viewed as equivalent representations. So we'll come back to this notion of what is and what isn't an equivalent representation in a moment. Um, but the second, uh, the second property that we would like is that the distance is symmetric, so that our distance from x to y is the same from the distance from y to x. And then the third and maybe trickiest to satisfy property is this triangle inequality, which says that the direct path between two points is always the shortest. So for any three networks, x, y, and z, the distance from x to z is less than the distance from x to y plus the distance from y to z. And of course, this agrees with our intuitive notion of space. So distance functions that satisfy all, th all three of these properties are called metrics. So the first question you might ask is, why is it important for us to think about defining proper metrics? Um, so, so to answer that question, let's think about what happens if the triangle inequality were violated. So if we had a scenario where the distance from x to z was greater than the distance from x to z through some intermediate point y, then the right-hand side of this expression implies that x is close to y and y is close to z. But for the left-hand side to be greater, we must have that x and z are very far apart from each other. And this contradicts our intuitive notion of distance, and, and it complicates analyses like clustering. So if you think about this um, within the context of clustering, the configuration of points on the left would suggest that y should be put into the same cluster as x and z, because all three points are nearby. But the configuration on the right suggests the opposite, because x and z are very far apart. We want to put x and z into different clusters. So it isn't clear how we can reconcile these, these kind of contradictions. And this is why having a proper metric space that obeys the triangle inequality is, is in some sense kind of necessary to have rigorous clustering algorithms. 
And you can go through a similar exercise for um, k nearest neighbor classification and regression algorithms. You also run into similar contradictions if the triangle inequality isn't preserved. Okay, so the next question you might ask is whether existing methods, like I mentioned linear regression, satisfies the criteria of a metric space. And the answer is at least typically no. Most methods uh, that people are using in practice aren't proper metrics. And again, linear regression is the simplest example. So here I'm showing a synthetic example where the R squared of predicting Y from X is very close to one, while the R squared of predicting X from Y is close to zero. And intuitively this asymmetry and linear regression happens when the amount of variance in X and Y is mis mismatched. So while linear regression is a very useful method, particularly if we're interested in doing a prediction task, um, it can't provide us a metric. And it turns out that other methods that people use um, in the literature based on canonical correlations analysis, centered kernel alignment, representational similarity analysis, all of these are symmetric, but it turns out that they don't satisfy the triangle inequality. Um, although we talk about this in our paper and we show how that you can, you can kind of modify these methods to turn them into the shape metrics that I'm about to the, tell you about. Okay, so the next question is, does this actually matter as a point of practice? So if I use a, a method that violates the triangle inequality, is it really going to change the results? Um, and I think it's hard to give an answer in general, but I, I think that there's certainly cases where this is going to affect your results. So here I'm showing you one analysis that we did in our paper where we compared the output of a hierarchical clustering algorithm using a proper uh, metric based on canonical correlations analysis versus a heuristic similarity measure based on the average canonical correlation coefficient. So the details of this analysis don't matter too much, but you can see that the clustering tree or the dendrogram that comes out of the analysis is different depending on whether you use the proper metric or the heuristic. And what I think is important to emphasize here is that when we're interested in running unsupervised methods like clustering on the data, there isn't any ground truth benchmark that we can uh, turn to. So I think it's extra important for us to develop as rigorous a procedure as possible um, in the context of, of algorithms like clustering. Okay, so all of that hopefully convinces you that having proper metrics on neural representations would be useful, particularly if you want to scale up our analysis to you know, study many networks at once. So in the second part of the talk, I'll move on to describing how, how we can build metrics. And as I mentioned, we're going to be borrowing many ideas from this field of statistical shape analysis, which um, is now several decades old, but I don't think has been really recognized um, the connections here um, to uh, studying neural representations, either in neuroscience or in the machine learning community. So I'm just going to point out this really nice textbook by Dryden and Mardia, which goes over a lot of these fundamental ideas in nice detail. Um, one of the a lot of the applications that are shown in this book uh, talk about comparing shapes in two dimensions or three dimensions, but it turns out that basically all of these ideas can be extended very naturally into higher dimensional shape spaces, and this is what we're going to use for neural representations. Okay, so let me remind you of the problem setup. Um, so here we have two networks X and Y, and we've sampled their hidden layer activations over M inputs or um, conditions. And if there's n neurons in each network, then we can you know, intuitively visualize these matrices as being m points in an n-dimensional space. So each coordinate axis here corresponds to the firing rate or activation level of a different neuron, and each point corresponds to the output of the network in response to a different input or image. And the aficionados in the audience will recognize the connection here to work on neural manifolds. The idea being that you can continuously vary the input in pixel space and cause a smooth change in neural activation space, and this might trace out some low dimensional manifold. Now here I've, I've drawn the manifolds as being simple one dimensional curves, but in general, the points are gonna be uh, a very complex and high dimensional point cloud. Uh, the basic idea is that we wanna quantify the similarity in the shape of these point clouds, or if you prefer the, the similarity in the shape of these two manifolds. But remember the point clouds are gonna be rotated and misaligned from each other because the neuron labels are not matched across networks. So this means that the coordinate axes are arbitrarily permuted and rearranged. And the suggestion from shape analysis is to find the best rotation, translation, um, and scaling that aligns the two point clouds, as shown here. And then you can compute the distance between them in the aligned space. And it turns out that this defines a proper metric that satisfies the triangle inequality known as the Procrustes shape distance. 
Um, but it turns out that this is just one of the metrics you might use. Um, for example, another useful metric is to think about what happens if you pre-process the data by whitening. So if you whiten these two data sets to have identity covariance, and then you apply a rotational alignment, you get a different no notion of distance, which is different than the Procrustes distance. And it turns out that this second notion of distance is closely related to canonical correlations analysis, which I've mentioned is a method people have used in past work. So we're able to um, unify this um, perspective of neural network similarity based on shape metrics with some previous approaches. Um, and the CCA-based distance is different because it will say two neural representations are identical if you can find a linear transformation that aligns them. So it's less stringent than this Procrustes distance, which only allows for a rotational alignment. And again, both of these distances uh, satisfy the triangle inequality. So this is the only slide I have of math. I'm going to go over it relatively quickly, but I just want to briefly restate those ideas a little more formally. Um, we start with matrices X and Y. And in essence, what we start by doing is that we allow for a feature mapping phi, which in the case of CCA might be like the whitening operation, but phi could be uh, a different nonlinear function as well. And by the way, if the two networks have different numbers of neurons, we can think of this feature mapping as bringing them into a common dimensional space. So that's one way of dealing with um, networks that have different numbers of neurons. And then we're going to apply some set of alignment functions denoted by script G. And there's two technical properties that you need the alignment functions to satisfy. So the first is that they need to define a group. And the second is that the alignments have to be isometries on the feature space. Um, so intuitively, these two technical conditions make it so that the alignment operation is symmetric. So this is why if you're thinking of rotations, it's equivalent for me to think about transforming x, rotating x so that it aligns with y. I'll get the same prediction error as if I had rotated y to align it to x. And then if those assumptions hold, it turns out that the distance after the alignment um, produces a proper metric. It's actually very easy to prove this. It's in the supplement of our paper. It only takes five or so lines. Um, if you didn't follow those details, that's that's totally fine. The take-home message of this slide is just that we have a general recipe for constructing different notions of distance between neural representations. And all of these satisfy the triangle inequality. So for example, we can build very strict shape metrics that only treat X and Y as equivalent if you can find a permutation that matches their neurons in a one-to-one -one fashion. And on the other end of the spectrum, we can build looser notions of shape distance that allow for nonlinear alignment transformations. And for the aficionados, these shape metrics that allow for nonlinear alignments are related to kernel CCA. Uh, but the point is just that we get different metrics by choosing different nonlinear feature maps and different groups of alignment functions. So now that I've shown you that we have this general framework, the question you probably have is which one of these metrics should we use? I think this is a hard question, but I can give two quick points of guidance. Um, the first is that you should probably try multiple kinds of shape distances. And there, there really isn't a right answer because different distances will give you uh, complementary insights into your data. And I think that's a strength of this framework that it lets us unify many different notions of distance into a single theoretical framework. Um, but the second answer is that we might be able to use prior knowledge to guide our choices over what is the best shape metric to use. And I'll give a concrete example of this on the next couple slides. So in particular, I want to talk about measuring similarity across convolutional layers. So the convolutional layers are a very common building block in artificial networks. And I'm going to assume the audience has some familiar with, uh, familiarity with them. Um, in image processing, these convolutional layers are typically three-dimensional arrays with two spatial dimensions, uh, image width and image height, and then a third dimension which collects uh, the output of different co convolutional filters. And the reason convolutional layers are thought to be um, so important and why they work so well is that many computer vision tasks are invariant to spatial translations. So for example, these are two translated images of a cat, which are very far away from each other in the raw pixel space but we'd like the deep network to recognize a cat in both of these cases. So what we argue in our paper is that the appropriate shape metric that accounts for this translation invariance should allow for translations along the width and height dimensions of the convolutional layer and rotations or maybe linear transformations along the channels dimension. So here's a toy example that illustrates the point. I'm showing you three different networks here, XI, XJ, and XK. And um, the activations of XI and XJ are the same, but they're just spatially um, translated um, versions of each other. 
whereas XK is also uh, MNIST digits, but the pixels are permuted and the local structure is, just, is destroyed. So many of the current methods that people are using treat these activation arrays naively, and they start by flattening these three-dimensional arrays into vectors, and then you compute some measure of similarity like the average canonical correlation coefficient. And if you use these flattened metrics, what you'll see is that all three of these um, neural representations are viewed as identical to each other. The distance between them is zero. But intuitively, the inductive bias of, of convolutional structure should treat this third network, XK, as being different from these other two because the local spatial structure is destroyed in the image. So at the bottom, you can see that our proposed metric, based on our theoretical framework, does the right thing. It says that XI and XJ are the same as each other because they're just spatially translated. And uh, XK is, diff is distinct from both XI and XJ. So this is just a, a simple example of how we could propose a novel metric that captures something that we think is important and interpretable about the deep network architecture. And one of the exciting things about this project is that there's many other groups in deep learning that are converging onto similar ideas. And um, there's a lot of papers coming out building up mathematical theories of these task invariant uh, neural representations. So I think convolution and translation invariants that I mentioned on the last slide is maybe the simplest example. But there's many other kinds of task invariant transformations and inductive biases that people are putting into neural networks. And I think that we can uh, turn those into um, complementary shape metrics. Um, so this is just one example from a, a paper that's being presented next week at NeurIPS. Um, but I'll quickly give an, a pointer to another paper by Taco Cohen and Max Welling. Um, so this was published a few years ago, but I think um, this was one of the first papers that really kicked off this line of theoretical research in the deep learning community. Um, so I just point these out because I think the connections here between the framework I showed you and this existing literature in deep learning um, is going to be really interesting to uh, dig into in the future. OK, so in the last uh, five to 10 minutes, I, I, I want to move on to some applications. I've told you why establishing a metric space is important, and I've told you how to do it. And now um, I can have done the hard work in some sense, and, and we can show some proof of concept applications. Um, so again, we start by measuring the activations of K neural networks, something like 100 mice or 100 different artificial networks. What we're going to do is compute the pairwise distances between all pairs of networks in our ensemble or cohort. And we're going to collect these distances into a K by K matrix. This is going to be a symmetric matrix. And also, all triplets of uh, networks within this matrix are going to satisfy the triangle inequality. And now, once we have this matrix, we're more or less done because we can pass off this matrix onto various off-the-shelf uh, off uh, methods on scikit-learn and other software packages. They'll perform things like hierarchical clustering, which lets you cluster and linearize this data set. And you can also um, apply prediction methods based on, on k, k nearest neighbors. And both of these methods have theoretical guarantees that you can cite um, in the case where the triangle inequality is satisfied. So this already gives us a pr pretty powerful methods. Um, but if you're OK with making some further approximations, you can, you can push this idea even further. So other methods like PCA, um, linear and nonlinear regression, um, manifold estimation, et cetera, often require you to input your data as a collection of Euclidean vectors. So what we'd really like to do is put all k of these neural networks into some Euclidean space where their pairwise Euclidean distances of the vectors in this space match the pairwise shape distances as close as possible. So it turns out that it's generally impossible to do this exactly. Uh, but empirically, I'll show you that we can, do, um, we can find a pretty reasonable approximation. And we do this by using classic multidimensional scaling. So this is a really simple and well-known technique that optimizes over the embedded vectors, z1 through zk, one for each network. And you minimize uh, this objective function, which is, which is known as the stress. So once you have these optimized embedded vectors, zi and uh, zi through uh, zk, um, you can use these embedded vectors for downstream tasks. And empirically, we think that this works really well because the uh, embedding, um, the embedded vectors recapitulate the shape distances um, to a very high degree of accuracy. And that's what's being shown here. These are two plots for the two data sets that we uh, studied in our paper. So the take-home message here is just that if we accept this approximation error, 
we can use essentially any off the shelf machine learning model from scikit-learn or whatever software package you use to um, compare neural representations at this kind of cohort uh, level. Um, so just very briefly, I'll talk about some applications. The first data set that we analyzed in our paper was this public neuropixels data from the Allen Brain Institute. And this characterizes visual responses of several mouse brain areas, cortical areas shown up top, as well as areas in the visual thalamus. And on the right, you can see the spike patterns that are recorded in response to three simple stimuli. Um, so we organized this data by pooling neurons together based on their brain region and across all the different um, input conditions that the Allen um, Institute uh, studied. So here's, for example, three different brain regions. And we run it through the pipeline I just described to you. We compute all the pairwise distances in shape space between these brain regions. And then we find an approximate Euclidean embedding and then perform PCA. So that's what you're seeing here. Each point on this plot corresponds to a different brain region. And if two brain regions are close in this 2D projection, then they tend to be close to each other also in the shape space. And we've colored the points based on their annotation in the Allen Brain Atlas. What you can see here is that the cortical regions in cyan and teal cluster together. And if you look um, more closely, you'll see that the visual cortical areas cluster together, whereas other cortical regions like auditory cortex and somatosensory cortex are in a different region of the plot. And also the visual thalamus areas cluster together. So I, I don't want to read into the tea leaves of this too closely. Um, this is just a proof of principle analysis, but this layout of brain regions based on their representational geometry kind of nicely recapitulates what we know about the anatomical structure. So this was, this was a nice uh, proof of concept for us. And another analysis that we did just to show a different, uh, a different possibility within this framework is to plug in the embedded um, representations into a regression problem. So here we tried to predict a, a brain region's anatomical hierarchy score. This is uh, something that was defined in previous work by the Allen Institute. And we showed that you could do a reasonably good job of predicting what a region's visual hierarchy score from its position in shape space. So that's um, a pithy way of summarizing this is that we're able to predict a feature of brain structure from brain function, which isn't necessarily uh, an, an obvious or expected result. Um, so I think I'm running out of time. So I'm going to quickly skip over this other application that's in our paper where we uh, analyzed a collection of 2,000 deep networks. The point of this analysis was just to show that we could scale up our analysis to a, a large number of networks. Um, but I'll note that we're still two orders of magnitude below the full data set um, that uh, was created by this group at Google. Um, so I think that there's an opportunity for us to develop clever computational tricks to scale up some of these ideas um, even further in the future. And uh, we also ran another regression which showed some interesting things on this data set. And here are the PCA um, projections showing each point here is one of the 2,000 networks um, that we analyzed. And interestingly, the representational geometry kind of showed very similar patterns across all layers. So if two points uh, had similar representational geometry in an early layer, those points also seem to have similar um, distance in shape space in deeper layers, which, which was kind of an interesting result. OK, so with that, I'll, I'll just close and summarize because I want to take questions. Um, I told you that I think that there's a really great opportunities both in neuroscience and in machine learning to study large collections of neural networks. Um, I think this is an exciting direction that the field is going in. Um, and I told you that I think shape metrics are a useful way for us to make sense of these large data sets that uh, are comprised of many different networks. Um, shape metrics are rigorous because they provably satisfy the triangle inequality, and that kind of sets a foundation for many analyses like clustering and nearest neighbor algorithms. Um, they're also um, very flexible because there's many different notions of shape distance that you can come up with, and you can adapt these to the structure of the network, like I showed you with convolutional layers. Um, and then finally, maybe this is a little bombastic, but I do think um, this is foundational in the sense that shape metrics um, are setting the stage for really interesting analyses uh, on downstream tasks, um, like, for example, dimensionality reduction, clustering of networks, and using um, neural representations uh, to do interesting regression problems. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll stop and take questions. I'll thank my co-authors again, and I'll um, say that we're interested in hiring postdocs at the Flatiron Institute.
Uh, so please reach out to us um, if that's of interest to you. Awesome. Thank you for the great talks, uh, Alex. This was lovely. I think we have about four to five minutes for questions, so I'll jump right into it. So I've been monitoring the Ask a Question tab where a bunch of questions are getting upvoted. And I'll start with one from Sarasola asking uh, the following. So on the question of permutations in the labeling of neuron to establish equivalence, how would this work across different animals or across different brain regions? Um, hi, Sarah, that, that, that's a great <laughs> question. Um, so I'll, I'll go back to that slide. Um, I think that it would be really difficult, potentially difficult um, in cortical brain regions where um, we don't have a good sense of, of neural identity, um, but I could imagine some applications of this in neuroscience on, on smaller circuits, like in like in C. elegans, pot potentially, um, where we do have a good sense of neural identity, but maybe in some experiments, we don't have accurate labeling of those neurons. Um, mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, I mean, I can come up with examples in, in artificial networks where the permutation distance might be useful, but off the top of my head, it might be a little more difficult in biological experiments. Right. Fair enough. So the the uh, next uh, upvoted question, which uh, was one of mine, actually, but I'll, I'll, I think a lot of people wanted to hear the answer, so I'll read it. So uh, a big limit limitation of probing representations in brains is the undersampling problem. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we can't recover from all relevant neurons. Yeah. Uh, and I know you've touched on this a little bit, but, you know, should this be a point of desiderata for your metrics, right? Like baked into what you want, or at least having a handle on sensitivity to subsampling. And so was wondering if you can comment. I'm sure you've thought about that. that I, I, I'm, I've absolutely thought about that. And we're about, um, me and Simon are working on this at least. And we're about 50% way through like a follow-up paper that studies this. So okay. I, I think one of the nice things about posing this problem as a statistical shape analysis uh, is that I think it, it gives us a, a kind of toehold into um, a follow-up um, kind of questions and um and research that any self-respecting statistician would like to know. Like how many neurons do you need to sample to get an accurate estimate of this okay. distance? How many images do you need to sample, et cetera? How do you deal with noise is another thing that I didn't mention, but we're interested in. Yeah, uh, very cool. So maybe one last question here from, um, whoops, my stuff is shifting here. Uh, Venkatesh, uh, uh, Medabalimi, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name. So how does computing the suggested metrics uh, scale with size of representation? So I know there's there's been a few metrics that you bundled up here, but like have you thought about scale? So, yeah, complexity, like compute yeah. complexity, right? Yeah. Um, so most of them uh, scale um, the the uh, off the top of my head i i we, we actually did work this out in the paper but it scales worse with the number of neurons than with the mm. number of images because usually you're averaging over the image um dimension so um and, and in many cases like in the allen brain atlas you know we can pre-process by pca down to 50 or so pcs in the neuron oh, to dimension. begin with ah, yeah well because that preserves 99.999 percent of the variance yeah um, yeah yeah so, fair enough um, so the idea being that, and, and this is actually like a little bit of a answer to the previous question, which is that, you know, if you collect enough neurons so that the more neurons you collect isn't substantially changing the number of principal components you keep, then you're not really changing the geometry, yeah. the effective geometry very much. Yeah, appeal to like random sampling principles and then- Yeah, yeah, it's a free. random projection essentially. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Syria, you know, has done work on this. Yeah. All right. Okay. This is lovely. We can continue talking about this for ages, but I think in the interest of time, I'll thank you once again, Alex, and then we will be uh, here shortly with the next speaker. Yeah. Thank you. And thank right. everybody for showing up.